Yeah, I decided to give some water to shelter. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time because there is another alarm in Kiev. And right now, I'm going to get my mother and take her to the shelter. Я очень благодарен всем еврейским организациям Украины. Мира вам всем. So here's a bit on the situation. Uh... Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Judah Siegel, the chair of the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Jewish Federation of Raleigh, Cary, and Wake County. Uh, tonight, we have a special briefing on the war in Ukraine with Ilana Breutman, Jewish Federation of North America's Senior Vice President for Public Affairs. Breutman and her family were among the tens of thousands of Jews who fled the Soviet Union in the 70s and 80s to escape anti-Semitism. Uh, Breutman has staffed the US House of Representatives Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, served as a leading senator's senior advisor for national security, and as deputy assistant secretary of defense uh, and USAID senior rule of law advisor. She has spent years as a leader in the Jewish community. At the UJA Federation of New York, she was senior vice president managing government relations. So uh, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Uh, and leading our discussion this evening is Phil Brodsky. He is our executive director of the Jewish Federation of Raleigh, Cary and Wake County. Uh, Phil. Thank you, Judah, and thank you, everybody that's joined us tonight. We have over 40 people that are watching on the Zoom right now. Um, thank you all for logging in. And we're also on Facebook, so I'm sure we're picking up uh, additional participants there. <clears throat> I'm really excited that we're able to uh, have Alana join us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we, we've been talking about what's going on in Ukraine every day, and I'm just so pleased that I know you just came in right out of another meeting to join us here tonight, um, but I'm really thankful that you're taking the time to be with our greater Raleigh community and talk about what's going on. Um, I'm gonna start out with asking some, well, you know, asking you to introduce yourself to us. And I have some questions here that we prepared, but we do have a Q&A option uh, in the Zoom. So as everybody that's watching is listening, if you hear something that comes up and you'd like to hear a little bit more about that, or if you have another question, please write them in. Um, Judah and Jory are gonna help make sure I see those and I'll do my best to ask the questions we prepped in and, and what's coming in from everybody watching. Thank so, you, Phil. Yeah, thank you for joining us and please and you know, introduce yourself to the community and tell us about your connection with uh, uh, the Jewish community in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, Thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you for being interested in this topic. Um, I, I am um, uh, 
it's, it's meaningful to me how our community has really rallied and it feels like our, my life has come full circle in what I'm able to do. And I have to say, shout out, different part of North Carolina, but I, my first cousin, his family live in North Carolina. So I do like your fair state. Um, so we came to America when I was almost 10 from Odessa. And there were many reasons to come. We weren't able to practice our Judaism. There was the political and economic oppression. And we actually went to a small town in upstate Pennsylvania when we first came. And then I grew up in Texas. So I feel like um, I went from something that many of my friends growing up thought was so exotic. They asked me silly questions like, do you have television refrigerators? Um, to, you know, really middle of the country. And I really grew up as a true blue American in um, diverse American circles and not so much in, in Russian circles. But the, the love of Odessa specifically, the city I'm from, was just woven in through everything. It's, it's an incredibly meaningful place. And I have to say that in the past couple of weeks, watching that train that went from Odessa, which is near the Black Sea, it's in the South. It's a very wealthy city with a lot of uh, resources. And it's sort of a plum for anybody to take over and has been for centuries going back and forth. Um, when I watched that, the people going on that train to escape to Poland, it reminded me of the stories my grandparents told because my grandfathers both fought on the front against the Nazis and my grandmothers and their older uh, family members all went to the Far East, you know, different directions, same train. Um, it was just reverberating. Um, I thought about how I'd come back to those states as part of the US government years ago. I'd come back on a personal trip. I remember going to a synagogue in Odessa that had been built, it was beautiful, but it was one I'd never entered when I was a child. In fact, nobody since my great grandparents had because had they gone to worship, they would have lost their jobs. And I think about what's going on there. Odessa is not quite under siege yet, but these are, I mean, of course, the human impact, the human toll is the most important, but then there are these symbols of our history that could also be destroyed. Um, and so I know we'll get into some of these questions that I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, I will just say that in terms of personal history, I remember um, I had worked in Congress and Pentagon and, and other parts of the US government for many, many years. And I remember asking my, one of my grandfathers one time if he was disappointed that um, I didn't end up, you know, zero generation immigrant just going into business and trying to make money because we came with literally nothing as, as you all know as that's how refugees come and he said to me and I remember we were looking at the capital I will get a little teary and unprofessional but he said to me this is why I left everything because as a as a Jew and as a woman you would have never been doing what you're doing now and so um I feel so proud to have been able to serve in government and serve the Jewish community and at this moment, when we are doing so much to rally behind the Ukrainian people, I mean, it's more than meaningful. I don't know. I don't know a better word, but it feels that the word doesn't feel like enough. Right now. It's a amazing. The story about your grandfather is really amazing, and it, and even you talking about how you feel like your personal story is coming full circle, but also the metaphor of the images that we're seeing and the connections back in Europe. Um, before we talk about what's going on in the war now, can you give us a sense of, I know JFNA and our, our international partners have been so involved in Ukraine. Can you give us a sense of what uh, life is like for the Jewish community there um, now, you know, in, in yeah. 70 years past the Holocaust, what, what is it, what is life like there prior to uh, the war breaking out? Sure. Um, well, first of all, let me start with the thanks, because what, what our partners can do, the joint a Jewish agency, others, what they can do on the ground day in and day out and when crisis hits is because federations and their volunteers have been supporting them with so many resources for so many years. So even though we then initiated a special campaign and we 
are pleased that we closed on $20 million to send for this emergency situation. Frankly, that couldn't have done the job if they weren't already there for years, knowing what to do on the ground. But before, before the, the, this, this war, Jews in Ukraine, in Russia, and you know, uh, a number of places, there were certainly Jewish communities. Some people stayed. I mean, obviously the Ukrainian president himself, but also a number of people in his government whom I know. One people stayed, one people came back. I have, I have um, cousins who live in California, but they found opportunities when they go back and forth. You know, it felt like a, an open space again. And certainly, I would guess somewhere I'm from, and just to come back to that city over and over, because it was such an integrated city and such a Jewish city. And it's not that anti-Semitism wasn't felt there. I have personal stories even from my childhood, but it was just different. And so people felt comfortable coming back. There were Jewish orphanages that really flourish, Jewish schools, um, organizations like Chabad rebuilt the synagogues. I mean, I, just to give you another little anecdote, I was on a US government trip, this is US, years ago, and we were in Minsk and it was over a Jewish holiday, it wasn't my choice to go, I was in the minority at the time, but I said, I have to go to synagogue, you know, just like, even if I have other meetings, I've got to just duck out. And it was a, a, um, a, uh, an, uh, an Orthodox synagogue. And so I was shut, I went to a little room for the women and I hear them talking and I didn't want to be rude to these ladies. So I turn around and say, you know, I speak Russian. So of course we start Jewish geography. And of course somebody was a from Odessa and knew the street that my grandparents were on. That was Jewish life in the past, you know, since the night, past 30 years, right? It was there. I can't vouch that there wasn't some anti-Semitism somewhere, right? I mean, we would see uh, in the news um, sort of neo-Nazi paraphernalia around some of the, um, you know, uh, skinhead type of gangs as there are in, in the US as there are in other countries. But it was not the, um, it was not what was happening in, in the turn of a hundred years ago and it was not um, under communism. So, What's hitting, what's hitting now is hitting the Jews of Ukraine, just like it's hitting the non-Jews of Ukraine. And I've also seen stories about um, Israelis needing to evacuate from Ukraine right now. So even Israelis are going to live and, and work in Ukraine, which is a... Yeah, well, there was all over, you know, as, as is natural, there was so many uh, Russian-speaking Jewry, because as you all know, no matter where you came from, Jews mostly spoke Russian at home, and then the, the language of the state they lived in, like Ukrainian or Uzbek or what have you, outside. But the ones who went to Israel in particular, it's so close that there were natural business ties and opportunities and natural technology collaborations and education collaborations and the arts. And um, so there were a lot, uh, a lot of people who luckily had a place to go in Israel immediately. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that would have been stuck otherwise. And now you see Russians trying to leave Russia because they're worried about martial law. So, Alana, can you give us a sense of, we're talking about life prior to the war, like what's going on now? How is the Jewish community there doing? To And I know things are probably changing minute by minute, but. Well, in, in Ukraine, people are just fleeing. Right, and, and it, for the Jewish community, from everything I can tell, for the Jewish community, like the non-Jewish community, men are being told to stay back to, to work, uh, to work, excuse me, to fight. Um, uh, women and children are leaving. And what is incredibly lucky for the Jewish community is they have a place to go right away. Our CEO, Eric Figerhut, was on an Aliyah flight last night from Warsaw, I think it was from Warsaw, to um, Israel. So, you know, that's that tie with Israel is so incredibly, I mean, it's incredible always, of course, but it's so incredible at this moment of just urgency. Um, and so the Jewish community is leaving and I'm, I'm sure that there are people who can't leave. For example, I know of examples, not necessarily in the Jewish community where there, you have just very elderly, very frail people, people who are very sick, it's just, leaving and the arduousness of the, of the trip right now is, is not an option for them. And my guess is, although I don't know the example off the top of my head, 
I'm sure there are Jews in that situation because you have, you know, you just have frail people, but there are organizations that have done heroic work in getting as many frail people out as possible. These Jewish orphanages that have been able to get children out very quickly. Um, it's really heroic work. I think. Oh, the pictures of Eric on the flight um, flying with hundreds and hundreds of people uh, to Israel. And they, it was really, uh, if you haven't seen them, they're on JFNA's Facebook page. It's, it's really very touching to see um, the people there, the smiles, people kissing the ground to be out. Um, is, is, are, are they coming to make Aliyah or are they just coming to you know, get to safety? They're, they're calling them Aliyah flights. So it's also, um, I, I think there's a huge risk. I, I'm not predicting this, but I think there's a huge risk that, it's, that we're in for the long haul for what, what's happening now and the kind of destruction that there is. Just imagine, I mean, Ukraine or Russia, or those countries, they're just like America in terms of the style of living, right? So people had to go with a backpack on their back and then when a building, just imagine an apartment building destroyed, what are you going back to? You don't have the kind of insurance system that you have over here. Um, rebuilding your life there is, uh, even if everything were to go back to normal now, would be incredibly difficult. And what, do you, so the, the people come to Israel, um, I think, Probably everybody on the call is familiar with Aliyah, people coming to Israel to immigrate there. Um, you know, in this emergency situation, you know, what happens next? They get off the plane. How does this, what, what is Israel and, and the Jewish institutions doing, J Jaffe, to welcome them, bring them in? Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's more urgent even than, than normal. And uh, I have colleagues on the ground there, so I'm not there with the minute by minute, but it's it's um, getting them documented, getting them set up with with shelter and, and food, and they're, they've been traumatized. There are incredible organizations like the Israel Trauma Coalition that, you know, have unfortunately been built to handle all the all that Israel Israelis have gone through with violence that can turn that they're, they're there and they're available to support all of that mental health um, uh, trauma that people have experienced and that people really need um, uh, in addition to the immediate concerns. And, and then they, you know, in the next days, they're starting to figure out next steps. Are they remaining, uh, you know, how, how do they settle them? Many will not know Hebrew, um, I would imagine, although more than had, had left, when, more than the population that had left when my family was leaving. So there's, you know, as you know, um, Israel does a great job of really integrating people and in culturally and and uh, with language, because even though we're all Jews, Israel is a different culture <laughs> from Ukraine. And so there's a lot of that. Um, you think you don't need translation, but you kind of do. <laughs> so um, that's, you know, it's, it's uh, it, but they are, they're such, good planners, they, they really know how to do this. So even though it could be quite chaotic with so many people, I'm confident about um, them being able to um, really handle all the situations that arise and also help people who may have family in Israel, ensure that they're they meet up with them. And I'm real touched about how you kind of brought up the example of having the trauma experts there on the ground. Um, there's something so moving just about the Jewish spirit and uh, not just welcoming people in and putting, putting them right into a dormitory or something, but being there for them physically, emotionally, uh, talking about their trauma. You know, it's so nice to see that here now. And also, you know, it's just part of the Jewish people that were, you know, the joint distribution committees doing that all over the world. Um, Isra aid brings not just emergency aid workers, but people to work with kids and family um, when there's a, a disaster somewhere else in the world. Um, maybe it's just being part of a people that's dealt with so much trauma over several thousand years. Um, you know, it's, it's part of just 
paying it forward and taking care of other people. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a, we have a question here about the scope of the numbers. Do you have a sense of the size of the Jewish community in Ukraine and also um, how many refugees there, there are in general, what that looks like? So um, I'm not an expert on exactly the number that in Ukraine, I've seen about 200,000 is the number that stands out, but I don't wanna be quoted on that because I'm not the expert. And um, overall refugees at this stage are over 2 million. And people, we were in Washington yesterday and people are expecting to, um, for that to grow. So as Eric went to Warsaw to welcome and, and go on an Ali mission, another group of us, with, uh, the lady and professionals about across the country went to Washington because we were advocating for certain provisions, um, which actually are passing tonight in the Senate, um, the Lautenberg Amendment, which is so meaningful to us, for that to be reauthorized so that some people who are in the pipeline, Ukrainians in the pipeline, can come to the US to join their families. Um, we were advocating for the aid to Ukraine. And we were talking about how there may need to be a large refugee flow into the United States. And as a community, we have a long history of supporting that and welcoming refugees and our, our agencies, as you know, whether it's JFSs or in some cities, JCCs, synagogues, et cetera, they really are the intake places. And so but we've been hearing from a lot of communities how they're ready to step up. And that was our message as well, that um, as we start to hear about the need to really resettle and not just leave people in Poland or Romania, um, that, you know, think of the Jewish community, not just for the Jews, which is in our history as well. Yeah, and, and I've received questions here about, do we know if there are any uh, refugees coming to North Carolina. Um, maybe that's, it sounds like maybe that's a little too soon to know, but you know, what, what does it look like? Do you think that's people are, you know, in timeline, are they going to be able to come to the U S is. So, um, I think that's our next step and we have to go through a little governance ourselves, but I think our next step is truly going to be to advocate for that. And then for there to be a big policy decision by the white house to start to resettle people. That can take that, they, then they have to interview people in the country where they found refuge, the Poland, et cetera, and then bring them over. And you bring refugees over based on finding sort of a host in a way uh, uh, for them. And that's exactly how my family came with HIAS. And so now we're, of course, supporting HIAS as well as, as the federations. So um, I think that's probably a couple months away at best. But we will, we will, we are at the moment working on a system because you know we have this entire system with the out, big outflow in the late 80s and the early 90s for the Jews of the former Soviet Union. We're going to resurrect that to be ready to um, to work on refugee resettlement, and I'm certain we, together with Hyas we'll set up a system where we can get requests like it sounds like we're getting here and able to push out requests as well so we can work fast. Yeah, it was a, this was on really before my time when I was just a little kid, but a major um, achievement of the Jewish people of the, or, in the organized Jewish community about resettling um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, can you say a little bit more about that, like lessons learned? And, and you mentioned highest, you want to talk a little bit more about what HIAS is doing there, what we might see from HIAS in the next couple months? Sure, well, HIAS is truly one of the premier global agencies, not just for the Jews, right? Like they're really among the best and, and the US government works with either eight or nine, I don't remember, resettlement agencies and HIAS is one of them. Um, so the role of HIAS would be to um, uh, um, help interview people overseas to go through the refugee process, um, uh, locate places to resettle them, do the, all that whole piece, like basically get families or individuals over here. And then it has been traditional that Jewish family service agencies, but also others, really take on the task of resettlement because what needs to happen? And I could, I, I think it's it'll be a bit easier now because there, you know, the the wall is down and there's the internet and more people know English and uh, et cetera, but, and uh, the economies are so much more similar. But when my family came, 
First, we had nothing, just like these, these people. These people have even less than we were able to bring a few suitcases. And then, you know, you come as a professional and your kids come and they're supposed to go to school and how are you going to enroll a kid in like third grade or seventh grade or 10th grade when they don't know English? And how do you get a job? Uh, and what if you're a doctor or a lawyer in the old country and now, you know, you, you can't pass the bar here, et cetera. So you have a slew of services from language to um, to training, to job search, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that would work that way. And that's what I think would work now as well. What was really interesting that was, that I think is gonna be different now for the Jews that would come here. When we came, it was three generations of under the table Judaism, right? And so without the lit lit liturgy, et cetera. And so when you first started to go to synagogue here, I remember my parents feeling kind of embarrassed because they didn't quite know all the rituals and, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and so I don't think that's gonna be the case now, but I have to say if I were gonna give um, one piece of advice for resettling East European Jews is to be really sensitive to their wish to learn, but their need to take it one step at a time. And, um, and one other thing is, you know, people don't, and this is so much in our religious uh, tradition, people don't like to hang out alone. And East Europeans, whether Jewish or not, are incredibly proud people, well-educated people, and being treated with respect, even when they have to take some, to do things be below their education level or what have you, um, that's going to be really critical too, because people don't want to feel like they're just getting handouts, especially when they were, um, you know, placed in a certain way in their lives prior to this. But I'm sure the North Carolina community would understand that perfectly well, but that was part of my childhood experience. We have uh, several questions coming in uh, that people are typing in. Um, I wanna ask about Zelensky. Um, <laughs> I love the headline from the Atlantic, uh, I think it was last week about uh, the Jewish hero that the world, the Jewish leader that the world needs. Um, how has it been for you seeing uh, the Jewish president of Ukraine on the world stage and how he's doing? And also as you're following the news and the briefings you're part of, um, the flip side of it, what are you intuiting or, or seeing about what role is uh, anti-Semitism playing here? Sure. Um, I mean, so proud, so proud to have a Jewish president, um, uh, the head of the country I was born in, um, but also in Eastern Europe where, you know, the spikes of anti-Semitism over the centuries had been so severe. And for him to stand there and say, you know, I don't need a ride, I need weapons, whatever you mean, but, you know, he's, he's standing tough. He's standing as tough as Golda Meir did. Um, and that's, I, I have pride just like I have pride when we as a community show up for other communities. And that says to every bigot out there, you know, don't believe what they say about us. Um, so that's wonderful. And, um, and I think it's really interesting that he's really, he has intuitively understood um, the, the importance of calling on the Jewish community. He understands that global support system that, and how we're trying to bear down. And he understands that we'll be there, not just for um, as much as we care about the Jewish communities in Russia, Ukraine, et cetera, but the, that we'll be there for, for others as well. Um, you know, there have been a few scattered reports of potential anti-Semitism. I think it's important never to discount that. But I will also say that when we were meeting with the Ukrainian ambassador last night, she raised these reports and some other things that were said. and. Um, and she said, and this would not surprise me given Russian history, that that is misinfor misinformation by, you know, by the Russians. Um, given what other things we've seen from Russia, it wouldn't surprise me. I don't have the intelligence clearing to know, clearance to know whether that's true or not, but I would be certainly, I would read everything with a critical eye right now. Yeah, but you know, I would I also wouldn't discount it. I mean, we have to, we we know historically when there's a bad situation somewhere and there's an opportunity to blame it on the Jews, it happens all too often. But one of the things that we're certainly thinking about, and I know 
uh, others, whether it's Jaffe, JDC, or the Israeli government, is to ensure that there's not a, um, a fallout for the Jews who live in Russia or in Belarus. Um, because we are, as a Jewish community, and Israel quite vocal about uh, supporting Ukraine right now. Do you think Putin is motivated at, at all here with an anti-Semitic agenda or largely a self-interest? I couldn't, his moves make no sense to, I think anybody thinking logically, so I couldn't possibly intuit what he thinks. I will say that it seems to me that the sort of claims of Nazism as they bomb close to Bob and Yar seem like awfully cynical use of tropes um, that uh, can only make it um, uh, the potential anti-Semitism rise more. What, you know, you're our representative on the ground yeah. on the Hill. Um, you were talking about some of the work you were just doing there today and last night. Um, uh, what are you hearing there? It, it looked like at the State of the Union, people were kind of coming together right now. Um, I'd say they still are. Everything we saw, we saw both sides of the aisle yesterday. Um, and on Ukraine, on the aid, people are very uh, united. You start to see more politicization of, of questions of military aid, which could be less about the substance and more about just, you know, shots at the other party. Um, you see, uh, and you definitely hear the consternation over energy sanctions because of what's happening with our own gas prices. But it seems to me that people are so outraged by Putin's actions. And by the way, I really do mean Putin's actions because I don't believe most Russian people actually know a whole lot of what's going on or are motivated by that. Um, so I, so at, at this stage, even for, harsh, for some of the, har the harsher economic measures that could unfortunately even have an impact on our economy, I, s I see people united. Now, if this drags on for two months, for five months, for you know, et cetera, I don't know whether they'll be that kind of unison because that's just not the nature of politics. And, um, going back to Zelensky for a second, how, how is his relationship with Israel um, impacting things? I have a question that uh, somebody read that he was going to address the Knesset. Has that happened? And what do you think about Israel or Bennett's potential role here as a a partner in negotiations? Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there was a lot of talk, actually, when we were in Washington, questions about, without any real conclusions, by the way, about Bennett's trip to Moscow, does it, is it, has, did it yield anything? What, what are the pros, what are the cons, what are the risks? Um, I think that, uh, I think Zelensky is, I mean, it's so smart. He also had a call with members of Congress, bipartisan members of Congress. Uh, I think that he's clearly using his entertainment background to do really smart PR and um, battles were always as much about the storytelling as, as the, you know, as the bombs and with, uh, with social media, um, even more so who, who controls that narrative is that's really important. So I don't think that it, uh, I, do, I didn't uh, pay, I didn't realize, or you know, I sort of have been in a bunch of meetings about the Knesset story, but it wouldn't be surprising given what he did with Congress, and maybe he'll he plans to do it with others as well. Um, it, it appears since since he said a couple times last week that he wanted the negotiations to occur in Israel as opposed to Belarus, which may have been just kind of a political tactic since Be Belarus is clearly on one side. Um, he, he, it appears that he feels some level of affinity or sees some opportunity for support. I mean, right now he's, his entire focus is on saving his country. So I think he's looking for opportunities wherever he can find them. And I know a lot of people here and all of us are thinking about how can we help. Um, 
Can you tell us, um, and I'm getting questions both about help for the Jewish community and help for uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, uh, generally everybody, not just the Jewish people. So I know that JFNA opened up an emergency campaign with the goal of $20 million um, over, when I last checked, over 7 million was raised pretty yeah. quickly right after opening. Can you tell us a little bit more about where yeah. that money goes, who it helps? And you've also mentioned the U.S. government aid, you know, where is that going? What is that totally. going to do to help? So we're, we're actually, I think we, we're actually at 20, but I, that doesn't mean that people shouldn't give because I, clearly more is going to be needed. Um, and that money goes to JDC and Jackie for the most part, and it's on the ground help. Some of it is in country. A lot of it is now with, you know, with the people who made it out to Poland or, or um, Romania. Um, uh, some of our emergency money may go to HIAS because HIAS is, is working on the ground with the refugees. This is really direct aid, it's really important. US government um, has in the, in the funding package that's supposed to be voted on tonight, close to 14 billion with a B for Ukraine. Some of that is military assistance. Some of it, it but most of it, or more than half, is humanitarian and refugee assistance. And it's, it's just about the immediate need. And then, so, so what would people do? People can help philanthropically. Uh, people can help ensure that they're, the, 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 next big, the next two big steps, that at least we're in the next step because we don't get involved on, on the military side so much, is continuing to support uh, humanitarian aid as needed, as it's identified, as the needs are identified, and um, you know, refugee assistance and resettlement if needed, which it probably will be. So that's for for elected officials, professionals to know, and then ultimately, maybe the communities, as you had said before, need to be generous and welcoming to these refugees. It's you know, it makes me really proud to hear how quickly the money was raised in the Jewish community system and to hear the uh, really large scope of help that uh, our government is sending. Um, is the money making an immediate impact? Is, are, are, is it getting there quickly enough? Are, are people starting to get the food, yeah. water, other supplies they need? Yeah, yeah the US government money will flow a little bit slower, but the State Department had already authorized some money that we sort of, the budget always has some money that could be moved around. And the philanthropic money moves be very, very quickly. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Any, you know, as you're going through this experience, anything else that has really been sitting with you or, or surprised you, something you've been thinking a lot about? Obviously, you're closely uh, connected here from a number of different, you know, really important angles and personal yeah. connections. Two, I guess two things. One is um, you had asked about these reports, the press about the sentences, et cetera. There are reports of all kinds of things. And given the, the geography of the conflict, you really have to be a critical reader and, and look for sources. There's a lot that's gonna be coming out that is as much about um, media warfare as it is you know, about the truth. And then it, this really brings home why it's so critical that we invest in the infrastructure of the agencies globally and domestically that provide services. Because whether it's the Ukraine crisis, whether it's COVID, whether it's an attack on a synagogue, you know, if we're not there the months and years before building the infrastructure that can quickly react, you can't really do anything once disaster hits. And so it, I guess it's a deep thanks because everybody on this call is part of the system. And I just wanna to report to you that what you do really truly makes a meaningful difference. So much for joining us, Alana. And, and it's also clear that what you do, what you're doing and what you're doing on behalf of us is making a huge difference. I was talking to my father um, who told me he thinks that our his his grandfather came from Ukraine as well. 
And uh, the name Brodsky, I unfortunately saw that there was a Brodsky family that had been killed trying to get out. I also saw that the Israel ambassador to Ukraine was Michael Brodsky. So I also am feeling uh, personally connected here. Maybe, you know, our families were, were, you know, used to hang out several generations back. It's pretty likely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you much, so much for joining Thank us. Um, Judah's going to close this out, but I think I can speak Thank on you. behalf of everybody here on the call. I, I saw we have our board president, Amy Bush, and many other of our board members and JCRC leaders and leaders in our community. I think we all really appreciate you taking the time tonight, and we'd love for you to come on down sometime. And I would love it. See you in person. I'd love that. <laughs> I'm sitting here actually in Fort Lauderdale right now for a BOCA, a couple of BOCA events. So just let me know when. <laughs> thank you. Well, a special thank you uh, to you, Ilana. And Phil, you did an excellent job. And, and, and Ilana, thank you so much for bringing the insights that we wouldn't uh, have otherwise had. Uh, so really on behalf of the Jewish Community Relations Council, which is a division, of course, of their uh, Raleigh Carey and Wake County Jewish Federation. Uh, we really appreciate your presence. You know, as we close here, I'm going to reiterate something. Um, most of us now, as we finish this Zoom, we say, okay, but now what should I do? And it's been said before, so I'll say it again. Really, we can help by making donations. Very simple. It's the uh, Jewish Federations of North America. That is our national body. Uh, you don't need to worry about the website exactly. Just put that in and you'll get it. And you'll have the opportunity to make a donation. Um, and again, reminding you of what um, Phil and Alana just said, it's really going to go to the Jewish agency, which helps Jews get to Israel, uh, to the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which really does so many social services throughout the world, particularly now in Ukraine, and to highest to help that helps Jews get from a, countries of oppression to countries of freedom. So the main things they're doing right now with, with your money are, are the uh, helping Jews with Aliyah, assisting internally displaced people, and securing temporary housing and food for, for these immigrants. So now to answer another question, I'm just going to point out, someone said, well, they want to help the whole Ukrainians as well as Jews. Helping the, the funds going to the Jewish agency is just for Jews getting to Israel. But the other services provided by our Jewish international organizations help whoever is there in front of them. They help Jews, but they all help non-Jewish Ukrainians who are in desperate need of help too. So to answer the question, the best place to make a donation is our national body, uh, the Jewish Federations of North America. With that, a dear thank you to you, Ilana, and to Phil uh, on behalf of our community. Good night. <laughs>